Hello, everyone, and welcome. The SWIG program in Jewish Studies and Social Justice of the University of San Francisco acknowledges our presence on the unceded land of the indigenous Ohlone communities and pays our respects to these traditional caretakers and elders, past, present, and emerging. It is our intention that this acknowledgement plays a role, however infinitesimal, in a much larger process of confronting the past in order to create a not yet realized future rooted in justice. I want to welcome you to the first event of the SWIG program in Jewish Studies and Social Justice for the spring 2023 semester, where tonight we will learn with Dr. Lior Sternfeld, who I will introduce more fully in just a moment. My name is Oren Kroll Zeldin, and I'm the Assistant Director of the SWIG program. I'd like to take a brief moment and tell you about the program. Founded in 1977, this is the first Jewish Studies Chair or program at a Catholic university anywhere in the world. In 2008, we were reestablished as the SWIG program in Jewish Studies and Social Justice the first academic program worldwide to formally link Jewish studies with social justice. Including a minor in this field, in the classroom, the program offers a wide range of significant Jewish studies courses not found in other educational settings. Beyond the classroom, we offer several extraordinary events that are free and open to the public, such as tonight's event. Let me tell you about the two other events that we will be hosting this semester. On Sunday, March 26th at 6.30 p.m., we will be hosting the second annual Alvin H. Baum Jr. Memorial Lecture in honor of an LGBTQIA Jewish social justice activist. This year's lecture will be, will be delivered by the former California State Senator, Mark Leno who was the first openly gay man elected to the state senate. His tireless efforts on behalf of LGBTQIA communities have paved the way for marriage equality in our state, and we are very blessed and honored that he will be coming to speak to us. Then, on Tuesday, April 11th, we will have the 13th annual Social Justice Passover Seder, which will focus this year on anti-racism. We will tell the Passover story while making connections between the ancient story of moving from slavery to freedom and contemporary anti-racist activism. If you'd like to learn more about these events and our program in general, please sign up for the mailing list, uh, which you can do on a sheet of paper where you first entered the room. Through the SWIG JSSJ program, we believe that education is the best long-term way to create systemic change. Whether one has the time to take a semester-long course or a mere few hours to hear from a single speaker, education is fundamental to making our world better, paramount in shining the spotlight on the margins, on oppressed communities who are mistreated merely because of their race, ethnicity, religion, gender, sexual orientation, or another social identity altogether. Now let me formally introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Lior Sternfeld is Associate Professor of History and Jewish Studies at Penn State University. He is a social historian of the modern Middle East and focuses primarily on Iran and the Jewish communities of the region. Sternfeld's first book, Between Iran and Zion, Jewish Histories of 20th Century Iran, was published by Stanford University Press in 2018. In 2022, he co-authored with Hassan Sarbakshian and Parvane Vahidmanesh, Jews of Iran, a photographic chronicle, which was published by Penn State University Press. His work is supported by the NEH, the Jewish Memorial Foundation, the Persian Heritage Foundation, the, D the JDC, and more. So please join me in formally welcoming Professor Sternfeld to USF.
Good evening. Uh, thank you, Oren, for this uh, generous introduction. And, uh, and I want to thank uh, Victoria, Farlo, and Oren for all the logistical work around this event. And I want to thank my dear friend, Aaron Tapper, for the kind invitation. I'm, I'm so delighted to be here tonight. Um, I want to thank the SWIP program for Jewish Studies and Social Justice at the University of San Francisco for sponsoring this event and for putting together two things that should be far better connected beyond the, the Bay Area of Jewish Studies and so Social Justice. <laughs> um, now, first of all, um, all the photos that you're going to see tonight, but two, uh, were taken by my co-author and my friend Hassan Sarbakhshian, the, the photographer. Um, and I started, I decided to start um, the presentation, the lecture today, with uh, photos of Purim in Iran. Uh, Purim, uh, tomorrow is, uh, is Purim Eve. Uh, Purim is the holiday uh, that Iranian Jews uh, celebrate as their own, uh, really their own. Something that took place around the same places that they live today and, uh, and had formative role in, in understanding the Jewish Iranian identity. Um, as you can probably hear, I'm Israeli. Um, I carry an Israeli passport, and as such, I could never visit in Iran. I could never visit Iran. I could never see the, the places that I write about. Um, so photography, photos, videos, taken in Iran by friends, by colleagues, become my way of visiting the country. Um, and working on this photography book um, was a way for me to visit Iran. This was a way for me to, to get into the places, the synagogues, the shops, the bazaars, um, because otherwise I, I just couldn't. Um, in September 2022, um, few weeks after the, the beginning of the movement that we see today, the Zan, Zandegi, Azadi, um, that I feel that we have to mention this moment uh, tonight. Um, a friend of mine from Tehran texted me that uh, he believes that my, uh, my visit to Tehran is closer than ever. I'm not sure that I share this optimism, but, I, but at least it made me feel like it, it can happen someday. Um, so let, let us begin into this uh, photographic journey that I want to take you tonight. And we are going to talk about um, Iranian Jews in the 21st century in Iran. Um, let's warm up with a quiz. What country has the biggest Jewish population in the Middle East? Now, show of hands. If you think A, Egypt is the answer, raise your hand. B, Iraq. C, Israel. All right, D, Iran. We have a very informed audience here. Israel, of course, <laughs> with a population of uh, some 8 million Jews is the biggest community in the Middle East. Now let's take the second question and Second out of three. So we'll do it like, wait, wait, don't tell me. If you get two answers right, you win the quiz. Iran. <laughs> Iran. Oh, yeah, right, wait. <laughs> what country has the second biggest Jewish population in the Middle East? Egypt, A. Iraq. Lebanon. Iran. Once again, I'm very impressed with your knowledge so far. Um, Egypt currently has a population of four Jews. Uh, Iraq is said to have one. Lebanon has 150. And in Iran, today we are talking about between 10 and 20,000. And I think that uh, recently the chief rabbi of Iran said 15,000. And I think that this is a good number um, to have. Which city has more kosher restaurants? <laughs> Austin, Texas. State College, Pennsylvania. Tehran, Iran, or Tel Aviv? <laughs> I, I, 
So I think that Tel Aviv and Tehran will be uh, in <laughs> close contest here. Um, it's very hard to find kosher restaurants in Tel Aviv. <laughs> and Tehran has four kosher restaurants. Um, this is from Isfahan. It's a kosher restaurant in Isfahan. Uh, one of two in Isfahan and, uh, and I said uh, uh, four in, in, uh, in Tehran and there is one more in Shiraz. Um, and now, let's get to the moment of, you know, how, do, how, do the, how did we get to the situation that in 2023 we have a population of around 15,000 Jews in Iran? Before the revolution in 1979, uh, Iran had a Jewish population of about 100,000 Jews. Um, about 60,000 lived in Tehran. There were sizable communities in Isfahan, Shiraz. Uh, I see that I wrote Shira instead of Shiraz. Shira is my daughter, so it's... <laughs> um, Isfahan, Yaz, and Abadan uh, were the biggest concentrations of Jews. Um, there was rapid transformation of the, uh, of the Jewish communities in Iran between 1941, when Mohammad Reza Pahlavi became the Shah, to 1979, the revolution that overthrew him. Um, for example, in the beginning of this period, in 1941, the JDC, the Jewish Joint Distribution uh, Committee, um, came to Iran to be part of the operation that assisted refugees from Europe, from Poland, um, to settle in Iran. It was one of few places that uh, Polish refugees um, that were, in, it's a long story, that were in Siberia during the war uh, could get into, and the JDC came to Iran, and, when, and they decided to survey the Jewish population, and they found that there were about 100,000 Jews in Iran. 10% um, of them were of the country's elites. 10% were the emerging middle class and 80% were lower middle class and impoverished classes. In 1977, the same organization surveyed the Jewish communities again, and they found that 10% still belonged to the country's elites. 80% were middle and upper middle class, and only 10% were impoverished lower classes. And this is, over the course of less than 40 years, such transformation is I think, unprecedented. Um, and if you want to know more about this, there's my book. But um, I just want to give you this, um, this information as we, as we move into this, uh, the more contemporary stuff. The Jewish communities in the 1970s uh, were very integrated, uh, overrepresented across many fields, in, in the medical fields, in academia, sciences, bureaucracy, um, in journalism. Uh, Jews were very well placed. And, um, and there was also a moment of, um, there was a moment of Jewish support for the revolution of 1979. Um, in fact, in 1978, the Jewish community elected a pro-revolution uh, leadership. All this to say that Iranian Jews saw themselves first and foremost as Iranians. They were Iranians, they were Jewish, there was no conflict, there was no need to settle. The grievances of the Iranian people were the grievances of Iranian Jews. After the revolution, and we can elaborate on each part of it uh, in the Q&A or discussion, uh, there was mass migration. Uh, to the U.S. and Israel and fewer to Europe. Uh, in 2000, uh, we get the first solid number of the post-revolution uh, size of the community, and it was 35,000. Today, as I said, it's between 10 and 20,000, and 15 is, is a good guess. 
Um, and there's a lot of misinformation about Iranian Jews. Now, the misinformation is kind of built into our public discourse. Um, we, we know a lot about the relationship or the lack of relationship between Iran and Israel, the animosity, the, the rhetoric around uh, the nuclear project and so on. And it allows the creation of this narrative of this realm that is beyond the pale. Um, we tend to think, and I'm going to show, to give you some examples, we tend to think about Iranian Jews in the same way that we thought about Soviet Jews in the Cold War. That they are locked, they are, they basically cannot move, they cannot leave, and, um, and it led to many problematic uh, assumptions. For example, in 2006, um, Amir Tahiri, who is uh, an Iranian journalist, um, he published a story in the National Post, the Canadian, uh, the Canadian newspaper, uh, and he wrote in this story that Iranian Jews are now required to wear uh, yellow badge, yellow star. Um, the implication are very, you know, obvious, right? It, it means that Iran is uh, treating Jews the same way that Germany treated Jews, and the fate of Iranian Jews will be similar to this of German Jews in the 1930s and 40s, and uh, it's called for action. The news spread out everywhere. Um, there were condemnations from wall to wall um, until, you know, moments later, when people were able to get the facts, it appeared that none of it actually happened. There was no such law, there was no such direction, um, but there was no way to retract it. I mean, I posted here, I couldn't find the, the original story because it was removed from the website. But I, I posted here the, the piece from uh, CBS News that shows that the National Post uh, retracted the publication of the story and apologized for it. This was one example. Now, I want to show you another example, and this is from a Srogim news website. It's a news website that identified with the uh, national religious um, uh, sector in Israel, um, and the title is Watch Imesh Kachech Yerushalayim on Iranian Soil. And they, saw, and they, they attached uh, a video of uh, an Iranian uh, Jewish wedding. But what in the title, what the title wants to say here? Watch. A subversive moment. Jews in Iran say, Im if I forget you, Jerusalem. And like you should feel the, the sensation, right? But what, Jews don't get married in, in Iran? Like they don't say it on a daily basis? But there is a, the story wants to say something, wants to deliver some, some you know, you should, you should feel that there is a moment that was captured on this camera that, should, that you should not see. And by the way, the, the, the video was taken from the uh, Instagram account of the rabbi that posts it like, Every, every day or every other day. So it's, it's even not, it's, even for lazy journalism, it's, it's too lazy. Or declaration uh, of, uh, of the chief rabbi in Iran in a conference of uh, religious leaders in, uh, in Munich that said, we have freedom of religion. And this was the headline of, uh, of the daily Ma'ariv uh, in Israel, as if it's, again, what does it mean? There are so many things that we can say about this title, but it, the fact that this is the headline of the newspaper is something that uh, we should 
we should ask. But this is something that goes back to the uh, early days after the revolution, that uh, in January 22nd, a week after the Shah left Iran, there was a, a story in the, in the Israeli daily Davar, uh, fears of establishment of concentration camps for Jews in Iran. And again, borrowing this imagery from the Holocaust, from World War II, that should make us feel as if there is imminent danger for Jews in Iran every, every day. So the reason that I embarked on this project um, was just, you know, to normalize Jewish existence in Iran. So we can talk about it in a non-hyperbolic way. So we can talk about the good things, the bad things, the ugly things, the beautiful things, and not in a sensational manner. And I think that this is a good picture of kids, Jewish kids playing the <laughs> Jewish... Uh, uh, compound of the of a school synagogue and uh, and house of the elderly uh, as as a way of normalizing talking about uh, about Jews in Iran. The Jewish community has had um, you know its own leadership um, from the the first institutional uh, leadership the Jews had in Iran was in the um, it, in the early 20th century, after the Constitutional Revolution, uh, minorities uh, organized, religious minorities organized their, around uh, community institutions. And, um, and even after the revolution, religious minorities kept their autonomous uh, status. And the IRI, the, the, the Islamic Republic of Iran, the constitution gave the minorities some of the protections that existed uh, during the Pahlavi uh, period. Um, again, it doesn't mean that, it means what it means. It means that there are uh, ways for the communities to run their own business in terms of religious affairs, in terms of uh, management of property, in terms of worship, uh, I should say here that religious, the recognized religious minorities that got those protections are Jews, Christians, and, and Zoroastrians. But for example, the Baha'i experience is profoundly different. Uh, Baha'is are not recognized as recognized minority, and therefore they are being harassed, uh, persecuted, um, and they don't have any of these uh, freedoms or protections. Um, the, the Iranian Jewish leadership um, is being elected by the, by the Jewish community. Um, they get to vote in the general elections and every minority is its own, um, its own region uh, for, the, for the elections. Um, there is, since the constitutional revolution of 1905-1911, the recognized minorities uh, get reserved seats in the parliament. Um, and today, the Jewish representative in the Majlis is Homayun Sameach. This is uh, Siamak Mores Sedek. He's the previous uh, Jewish representative in the Majlis. And this is, in terms of political leadership, this is, the, this is where, it, where it goes. This is how it, it is defined. The, the Iranian Jews, um, Iranian Jewish life, rather, are now centered around synagogues and uh, community institutions. Uh, this is uh, food packages uh, for community members before Rosh Hashanah, um, and it's outside one of the uh, Tehran synagogues. Um, there are Jewish schools in Iran. Um, after the revolution, uh, they were set up as Friday schools. There are Hebrew schools. Uh, I would say that um, there was also, uh, in 2015, under President Rouhani, 
uh, Jewish students in the public schools were given exemptions from attending schools on, on Saturday, on Shabbat, which was a major issue for, um, for the Jewish community uh, and something that they tried to achieve for many years and they finally got it done in 2015. Um, the religious schools uh, teach Hebrew and, uh, and, um, and Torah lessons. Uh, I love this photo. As we see the, the, the founding father of the Republic, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, and the Supreme Leader, Ali Khamenei, look at the Jewish kids when they grab the soccer ball and go out to the, uh, to the yard to play. Um, the leaders of the community say that attendance of synagogues and, uh, and community institutions is higher today than it was before the revolution. Um, the sociological explanation would be, well, now Jews are more uh, directed to go to, uh, to the community institutions. Um, but it also, it, it says something about the place of synagogues and religious schools um, in the life of, of Iranian Jews today. Um, also, religious institutions get funding from the state. So, in the past, religious synagogues and religious institutions relied on donations and membership fees. Um, and now, much of the budget, or larger sum of the budget, comes from the government. Um, the next holiday on the Jewish calendar is Passover, so I want to show you some of the beautiful traditions and peek into the houses of Iranian Jews during Passover. Uh, we see here the seder, uh, the seder meal on the floor, and, the, and the, um, there is a beautiful tradition of um, hitting one another with green onions during the Dayenu. Um, as, as, uh, as, as a symbol of the, uh, the slavery, the bondage in Egypt. And um, so now you have the, the opportunity to look into this uh, seder. Um, another um, Jewish, prominent Jewish institution um, is the Sapir Charity Hospital in Tehran. Um, this hospital had a uh, very interesting history. It was established in the, 19, in the early 1940s um, when Dr. Uhala Sapir, a Jewish physician, uh, worked as a, as a doctor in, in one of the, in the other Tehran hospitals. And um, he witnessed a case in which Jewish patient was being mistreated. Uh, and insulted for being Jewish. And then he decided to establish uh, the charity hospital that would provide um, care for anyone who needed it, regardless of their uh, religion or faith. Um, the, the hospital initially was built in the Mahale, in the Jewish quarter of Tehran. Um, it became Sapir himself died in 1941 um, when he was treating Polish refugees. Uh, he contracted typhus uh, from one of them and died shortly after, but the community carried his name and his legacy. And the hospital was, uh, became a very important uh, institution in Tehran and even played a role in the, in the 1979 revolution. Um, the photo on the right is the hospital during the revolution. Um, in one of the, um, during the demonstrations, um, the other state hospitals were required to report on wounded protesters that came to get uh, treatment. And the leadership of the hospital uh, decided they would not turn in any wounded protesters to the hand of the Savak the secret police. Um, it was a very controversial decision. And the hospital leadership, some of them supported the revolution, but others, but others did not. Bless you. 
Others did not. And for them, this was not about politics or this was not about the, the you know, it wasn't about the revolution. At the entrance to the hospital, as you can see in the sign from 1979 and from uh, 2019, it says, love thy neighbor like thyself. And for them, this was the motivation for sheltering the protesters. It was being Iranian, loving thy neighbors. Um, after the revolution, when the revolutionary government nationalized many of the institutions, the Jewish community got to keep the Jewish hospital as recognition of this role that the, that the hospital played uh, in 78, 79. The photo in the middle uh, is of a Jewish physician uh, in, the, uh, in the hospital. Now the hospital exists, its, its operation now is, uh, is almost down to zero because of funding issues, but it's now in, in the same place, the Mahale, the Jewish quarter, but the Jewish quarter is now overwhelmingly Muslim. Uh, most of the Jews left the Jewish quarter in the 1960s and 70s, um, and the hospital stayed there and kept serving the, the Muslim uh, population there. Um, and now, as I said, now because of uh, funding issues, um, its operation is in doubt. Um, I'm going to run through the others because I see that my time is uh, is. Uh, running up. Uh, this is a matzah factory in Tehran that, um, that still provides matzahs uh, to the Jewish community uh, till today. Uh, this is a better image of the, uh, of the green onion uh, ceremony, I should say. Um, Jewish business in the bazaar uh, rugs, uh, garments. Uh, these are uh, these are uh, industries that Jews were always prominent in, and and still today, even with the shrinking Jewish population in Iran, uh, many of these uh, of these stores are owned by by Jews. Uh, this image is out of place in the order. I don't know why, but. Uh, it's the same Passover seder, but I want to turn your, direct, your attention to the photo on the right and, uh, and see that after the, the seder, uh, they had to watch the soccer game of the national team. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I, I, I love this, uh, you know, um, this mix of, of religious and national cultures. Um, Hassan Sabahshian, the photographer, uh, joined the community on, uh, on travels to, uh, to shrines, on pilgrimage to, uh, to uh, Esther and Mordechai tomb in, in Hamedan or uh, Prophet Daniel in Shush. Um, and an interesting stop, you know, these are long rides, and along the way they had to, uh, to stop for breaks. And uh, on one of the trips, they, they stopped uh, in Qom, in the holy city of Qom, uh, in the Khomeini Museum. And I would have loved to know what was the conversation between these ladies when they were sitting outside Khomeini's living room um, and, uh, and seeing it. Um, shrines in Iran. And it's not unique to Iran. This is something that can be seen in other Middle Eastern cultures, uh, is that shrines and tombs are being celebrated and, and cherished and frequented by visitors from all religions, uh, Muslim, Jews, even places that are Jewish by definition are being, um, you know, are being visited by Muslims for the barakah, for the blessings of it, and, and so on. This is uh, on this trip uh, to Hamadan, um, and the Jewish, and what you see here is uh, a man putting on the tefillin, 
But what do we see in the background? Anyone recognizes slim chances? <laughs> it's Imam Ali, uh, the most revered Imam in, in the Shia tradition. And they just, on the way to, uh, to Hamadan, they stopped in, in a mosque for breakfast and, and morning prayer. And I, I, you know, you can see a lot, I mean, this is, again, this is just an ordinary mosque, but being in this space for Jewish shacharit service and putting on that feeling when the Imam Ali is <laughs> observing uh, this is one of my favorite photos from the book. Um, another instance is the, uh, the tomb of Serah Batasher uh, in Isfahan. Um, this place is, uh, is known as a, as, a, as a shrine that women, especially women, come to, uh, to get the, 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 the luck for pregnancies and, and marriage and, and so on. Um, and, uh, and again, this is, it's a Jewish site, but it's been visited uh, by Jews and Muslims and Christians. And uh, it's even this, most of the sites are uh, being run by the Ministry of, uh, of Religious uh, Endowments in Iran. Uh, all, all the Jewish sites but the tomb of Esther and Mordechai are being run by the uh, Ministry of, and of Religious Endowments, but still it is recognized as a Jewish site and, um, and treated as such. Anti-Semitism and anti-Jewish sentiments exist in Iran. Uh, even though, as the uh, ADL poll from uh, a number of years ago showed that Iran is the least anti-Semitic country in the Middle East, anti-Semitism is still very prevalent there. Uh, here we see a Jewish home uh, with, the, uh, with graffiti uh, that said Jude, which is a derogatory term for Jewish. Um, there were moments, there were trends of rising anti-Semitism around central uh, events. For example, during the, uh, the presidency of Ahmadinejad, there was rising anti-Semitism. Uh, during, uh, you know, moments of higher tension uh, between Iran and the US, Iran and Israel, anti-Semitism uh, rises. Um, Holocaust denial is a problem. Um, there were some attempts of the Rouhani government most recently to, to confront it. Um, but for example, on the website of the Supreme Leader, there, still quest there are still questions about the Holocaust. So this is a matter of, uh, you know, this is something that we have to uh, illuminate as well. Um, this is the house of the elderly in Tehran. Um, it's a compound. Uh, as I said, the, the first image that I showed of the kids playing in the, in the playground is from the same place. Um, it's a, it's a retirement place, it's a club, um, synagogue, and uh, even childcare facility. Um, after the, the revolution in 1980, uh, the Iran-Iraq war started, and this was a moment, um, this was a, a you know, a moment that shaped, in many ways, shaped Iran and shaped the Islamic Republic in the way that it did. Um, it was a defining, uh, it was a defining event for the first generation after the revolution. Um, the war, for those of you who don't know, lasted for eight years, and there were about 500,000 uh, dead people during the war, and over a million wounded um, on both sides. Um, the generation that grew up in the uh, in the shadow of the war, uh, this became 
the, their defining their defining event, and uh, Jews were part of the of the military. Uh, there was conscription, mandatory conscription to the army, um, regardless of one's uh, faith or religious affiliation. Um, and for many years, there was no recognition of the sacrifice of religious minorities in the uh, in the war. Uh, here we see this is in uh, I believe this is in Shiraz. Uh, it's a Jewish cemetery, and uh, the flags uh, show us that this is a marty from the war. Um, in 2000, uh, December 2014, um, again the Rouhani government um, unveiled monument commemorating the fallen, uh, the Jewish fallen soldiers from the Iran-Iraq war in the uh, Jewish cemetery in Tehran. Um, prior to that, uh, these images are from the Iranian uh, news agency. Um, prior to this monument, the only commemoration of uh, fallen Jewish soldiers in the war uh, was the uh, mural um, on the right, that ironically is on the back of a compound that was built by the Israeli construction company Solel Bonet in Tehran in 1960, uh, 1965, uh, Eskan, uh, the Eskan Towers. Um, and this was the, the only commemoration of, of the Jewish uh, martyrs. Um, now I'll finish my presentation with the kid that we all know from Shul. <laughs> this is again one of my favorite photos of kid that just had it with the service, had it with the prayer, and I want to thank you for your listening and attention. And I'm happy to open the floor for questions. All right. So our events management people. Uh, only provide us with one mic tonight. So if you have a question, I'll bring the mic to you, and then I'll bring the mic back to uh, the professor. Thank you very much for illuminating the speech. I've heard that to be a Jew in Iran today requires a very, very delicate maneuver, if you will, between what you can do, what you can't do, what you can say, what you can't can say, concerns about being overheard or being informed on. I guess what I'd like to know, in light of the anti-Semitism that is there, as well as the, the, the frequent allegations of possible spying by Jews for Israel, how dangerous or delicate is it for Jews, and how do they have to contain themselves to uh, not get into trouble? Um, thank you for this question. Um, Iran is not a free state. Um, and Jews have to uh, watch what they're saying as much as non-Jews have to watch what they're saying. Um, the movement, the protest that we see in Iran today is, you know, this is one of their top goals, is to break this barrier, to break this limitation. Um, you're right that Jews maybe in some cases have to be more careful than others, but accusation of espionage are not um, more prevalent than um, you know against Jews than than against others. Um, the last case that we had of of a mass trial was in 1999, um, which was a very unfortunate case of the 13 Jews that were accused of uh, spying for Israel. Um, because of international pressure, none of them was executed, and uh, I think that the one who served the longest uh, sentence in prison was released after two or three years. It was it was um, you know a, a stain on on the relationship between Iranian Jews and others, but this is not something that is marked by uh, or how should I put it? It's not something that. Holds, you know, that, that defines the relationship between Iranian Jews and the government. Um, but again, being an Iranian today is not easy. Being an Iranian Jew today is not easy. 
Um, what was the other part of the of the question? I, I don't recall, but why don't I just add the following additional, which is, can a Jew in Iran today freely emigrate and leave Iran? Yeah, so the question is, uh, can a Jew in Iran immigrate freely uh, out of Iran? And the answer is, uh, Jews don't have any more obstacles of immigration than non-Jews. I mean, um, many Iranian Jews travel to the U.S. to Israel. They don't. They don't say that to the uh, immigration control, to the border, to the passport control at the airport. But they can travel, and they, many of them do. Um, I, I just mentioned uh, today uh, that. I, I heard of many Iranian Jews that came to this country to get vaccines during the pandemic because they, in, in Iran they had uh, the less effective Chinese and Russian vaccines. Um, and this is something that is actually very important because it, it shows, look, we have to account for the numbers that have fallen from 100,000 40 years ago to uh, 50,000. It's a tragedy. It's, it shows that many who cho that many chose to immigrate out of the country, to migrate out of the country. But it also means that those who stay chose to stay. They choose every day to stay. There is a, there is a novel uh, memoir by Roya Hakakian that I love very much. And uh, there is a passage there that the family dreamed of the land of milk and honey, but wanted to wake up in Tehran. And this is something that I think even today is true to those 15,000 people that, uh, that choose to remain in the country. Why don't we get two questions? One, two, and then. Uh... Hi, um, I'm Iranian Jewish on one side of my family, but I grew up in Los Angeles. I really appreciate your emphasis on how in Iran, national and religious identity are very much correlated. In my experience growing up in Los Angeles, it's actually the opposite where I find that on one side of my family, there's kind of been an erasure of Iranian identity and there's a much larger emphasis on being Jewish and Jewish customs and Jewish holidays and traditions. And in that, Iranian identity is kind of washed away. And I just wanted to know, um, in your experience or your expertise, what can be attributed to that? Thank you for that. Um, this is the topic of my next book. <laughs> but I can share that uh, it has a lot to do with uh, the dynamics of Iranian Jewish, the Iranian Jewish community in Los Angeles post-1979. The, uh, the circumstances under which they migrated out of Iran, the circumstances under which they settled in Southern California, the relationship with other non-Jewish Iranians, but also with non-Iranian Jews in this country. And the need to again to uh, to protect their community and to uh, and to create a common narrative that would be uh, that would be something something of a glue that can keep the community together. Um, in Los Angeles, and Los Angeles is, is an interesting uh, is an interesting case, right? Because there are places, cultural institution that are shared by Iranian Jews and non-Jews. Um, for many, many years, it was Sherkat Ketab, the bookstore that was the cultural center of, of all Iranians. It was owned by a Jew, and it was celebrated by all. Um, there were other, like every time that there is a concert of, uh, of Iranian singers, it brings together uh, Jews and non-Jews. But the religious aspects in, in the U.S. were defined under U.S., you know, under American life um, rules and not, and not replication of, of life in Iran.
but again, this I, I, I should be able to say more in a few years. <laughs> Jews, broadly speaking, today are middle, upper middle class uh, in, in Iran, which in, today, in today's um, economic reality can say very little about their financial stability uh, because of inflation and, and so on. There are limitations on, on what they can do or what rent they can achieve in the economy, in the state bureaucracy and apparatus. Um, high ranks can be filled only by Muslims. And not only by Muslims, by Shia Muslims. Um, judiciary appointments are only for Muslims. Um, in politics, in the army, they can get to certain ranks, but not above it. Um, so. But again, most of the community today is urban middle class and upper middle class. And um, yeah, that's. Thank you for a very interesting and informative talk. The, to me, one of the most interesting things was how uh, Jews in the community supported, the, many of them supported the revolution. And in the hospital, they sheltered. They, they didn't turn over the protesters to the Shah Sabah. Because I think there was a revolution, and then there was a counter-revolution. I, I wonder what you think about that. I think there was, in 1979, a mass social uprising of many, many workers, farmers, middle class people, Jews, Muslims, against the Shah's brutal regime. But over by 1982 or so, power had been consolidated by, by the mullahs, by in a counter-revolutionary capitalist government. Um, I had a question for you. Uh, what, what's the attitude of the Jewish community in Iran toward Israel? Because the government, while it obviously tolerates the Jewish minority in a certain extent, also it has an official policy of calling for the annihilation of Israel and the death to the Jews. Thank you. Um, first of all, yes, they call for the, I mean, not officially, but they call for the annihilation of Israel, but not death to the Jews. Uh, this is actually, you can say that this is a talking point in which they can whitewash themselves, but they, but they don't say, they say that we are not anti-Semitic, we are anti-Israel. And like making this distinction helps them navigate, uh, you know, the world politics or how the world views them. Um, and what you said about the, the period of after the revolution, the post-revolutionary uh, forma state formation, uh, it's very true. And the, and the struggle started right the day after the revolution. Um, you know, there was pushback between the more uh, hawkish wing of the of the revolutionary movement by Khomeini and uh, and the other side was the more Islamist liberal uh, Mehdi Bazargan was the prime minister and there was there were fights between them about how the constitution should look like there was a Jewish representative in the uh, constitution drafting committee. And he wrote uh, reports for the Jewish community on what was going on in the, uh, in the discussion. And we also have the, the protocols of this committee, so we see what kind of powers played role in this uh, formation. The, the most famous example, perhaps, is uh, the, the hijab law, 
that Khomeini in March 1979 uh, said something to the effect that, uh, that hijab is going to become mandatory. And then on March 8, 1979, there was a mass protest of Iran. It was International Women's Day. There was a march of millions in the streets protesting against uh, this suggestion. And then Khomeini walked it back and said, hijab is not going to be mandatory. It's going to be recommended. And he was able to pursue it only during the Iran-Iraq war as a national emergency move. Because in, during the war, if you're against any move of the government, you are unpatriotic. You are against the, you're against the government. You're against the country, not the, not the decision. And in 1984, it became a mandatory hijab law. Um, so, and this is also why I said that the Iran-Iraq war, in many ways, shaped the country. Because everything, all these fights and pushback between different fractions of the movement stopped when, when the war started. Because then it was, we all have to stand behind the government, we have to be united and to win the war because otherwise, like, who knows what's going to be. Did I answer your question? I don't know. Attitude toward Israel? Ah, and towards Israel. Yeah, they cannot, obviously, they cannot say that they support Israel or, but also I think that they have, you know, more nuanced um, views towards Israel. It's not, like, it's not... Sometimes we, we tend to look at it as, as a you know, binary option. You support Israel or you're against Israel. And we have to understand that there's a range of like what, what is Israel for them. And there are many ways to look at it. Uh, the, obviously, they cannot support Israel. They cannot say that they support Israel. They cannot. But, you know, they also have like something that took a lot of space in the Jewish press in Iran in the 1970s, before the revolution, after the revolution, was the treatment of Iranian Jews that came to Israel. And they were being mistreated by the Israeli establishment. Some of, many of them returned back to Iran. Not, not most, but many in, in, in absolute numbers came back to Iran. And they talked about their experiences in Iran, in Israel. And this was something that before the revolution, after the revolution, they talked about a lot. And they talked about uh, Israel as part of the Middle East. And, you know, the Jewish community is not a uh, monolith. Some of them were very much critical towards Israel, genuinely critical towards Israel for the, uh, for the conflict with the, with the Palestinians, for the uh, insistence of not being part of the Middle East, or looking at, at itself as a European outpost. Uh, and some of them, you know, we, almost all of them have relatives in Israel. And many of them visit Israel on a regular basis. How, do you, how can we make up what it means for them, what Israel means for them, or what they think about Israel? I, I think that, the, that we have to look at, you know, to look at it as any other group of people with many opinions and many experiences. And, you know, we cannot, as I said, Iran is not a free country in, this, in the way that they can say whatever they want. But we can read publications, Jewish publications, and read between the lines. And sometimes it is between the lines that they say what they think on certain issues. Um, there was a, I, I was able to get archives of, of letters that Iranian Jews sent uh, back and forth between them and their families in Israel. And whenever they wanted to say something that uh, the censorship cannot, cannot pick up, because many times in the 1980s they opened letters, so they wrote, uh, they wrote certain words in Hebrew, even if it was in Persian, like they wrote it in Hebrew letters. And then you can see, as I said, between the lines, what they thought and what they wanted to hide and what they wanted to, and what they wanted the censor to read. And, and you could give a whole other lecture on the treatment of Mizrahi Jews in Israel, right? Yeah, I, I your Aaron, if you want me to, <laughs> if you want me to come, I'll, I'll come back. <laughs> sure. Hey, I want to ask you if you have information after the 1979 revolution, 
Some Jewish left Iran wanted if they are allowed to take their money with them or, or, or leave everything behind. Because Rahel is some uh, free brother of original from Iran. They, they smuggled the money out of Iran. They opened the Atlantic Casino in, in uh, Reno. But I'm not, I'm not sure if it's true or not. Yes, I guess I'm ask you about it. So after the revolution, um, Iran tried really hard to stop people, A, from migrating, and B, from taking assets out of Iran. Because they knew that the, 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 the entire middle class uh, would like to leave and take their assets with them. So they made it very difficult. Um, yet people moved, and people found ways to uh, it was extremely hard, in the, especially in the beginning of the 1980s, it was extremely hard to leave the country, uh, and it was almost impossible to get money out of the country. Um, many Iranian Jews uh, started to buy assets in Europe and the US uh, in the late 70s, those who had the means, um, and delivered some of the money. Um, Yeah, I, I mean, th there's also the conflict between, you know, the, the memory and the community memory, between the personal memory and the community memory. And people, I mean, the fact is that many people were able to get the money in various ways out of the country. Um, I'll share an anecdote. I don't know if I, I'll try to, not to share, <laughs> Uh, identifying information, but I interviewed um, a very wealthy Iranian Jew uh, for my research. He lives in, in the US and he told me his uh, story and he came to the country with a $20 bill in his pocket. And now he has empire uh, and he's a millionaire and And he told me that how he came to the country, he initially, immediately enrolled in, uh, in a public university, very prominent public university in the country, uh, got his degrees, uh, and then immediately opened uh, his first uh, business. Um, and it, you know, from that moment, he never looked back. And I asked him, with $20, bill in your pocket, how were you able to go to school, start business? Now granted in the 1970s, instant tuition was $500, uh, but how did you, like from student, you opened business, you, and he said, yeah, I came with $20 bill, but my family, like they were able to wire money <laughs> before the revolution and we had an account. So, you know, it's also like trying to fit into the, the story, the American, American dream story, right? That I came to the country with nothing and I built myself. Uh, but the reality is that people found the ways to leave Iran, even if it was hard, even if it meant like life risking uh, decisions, even if people found a way to leave the country, to get, to build themselves. There were many struggles for Iranian Jews and for Iranians and non-Jewish Iranians when they came to the US. There was, in 1979, I think that Iranians were the most hated uh, group in the US, especially in Southern California. There are uh, images from demonstration after the hostage crisis. There are images from protests in Los Angeles in front of the federal building. Uh, Iranians out, uh, get out of my country, and like, it, it was, very hard for Iranians in general than Iranian Jews. Um, but it's part of the broader story of, of migration and diaspora and uh, community building.
thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I'm curious, as someone, as, who, as you said, haven't been able or about to visit Iran for the last over 40 years, why did you decide to focus your scholarship on Jews of Iran? First question. And second, whether you know whether any Jews in Iran has participated in the current movement, Azaz and the uh, and what's their position? You know? So I'll start with the second part. <laughs> um, unlike 1979, Iranian Jews in the current protest decided, I mean, many of them decided to join the protest, but not as Jews. In 1979, we saw Jewish protesters carrying banners, uh, Jews for the Imam, uh, and other, and other, you know, they, they marched as, as as Iranian Jews. This time I know of, I, I don't, I can't say numbers, but I know of Jews that joined the protest as, as we see, you know, we saw it in 2009, there were few that five, I think five Jews were arrested uh, for being in the protest um, in December. Um, so I don't know how many chose to be there, but I know that some Jews were there. Um, as for why I decided to, <laughs> to focus my scholarship on Iran, um, it's a long story. The, I'll give you the, um, the brief uh, answer. I studied for undergrad and master's at Ben Gurion University uh, in Israel. I majored in Middle East studies, and uh, my second year undergrad, it was 2005, um, Ahmadinejad was elected president of Iran. Um, immediately, he started with his Holocaust denial and uh, all the crazy stuff. And Iran, that was always in the background of the news in Israel, became like the center of the news in Israel. And Israelis have this virtue of when something happens, everyone is expert on this subject matter. Um, and everybody talked about Iran, and I just wanted to know how can we explain Ahmadinejad? How can we understand Ahmadinejad as a phenomenon, not as a person? And there was a course in my department, Iran State and Society, and I took it. Um, it was the first, it was my second year in the university studying Middle East studies, and it was the first thing that I studied about Iran. I was, I was completely blown away with the, with the materials. And I read one book that got me to questions, to question so many of the things that I, you know, about me, about myself, about you know, I consider myself an informed citizen, not, you know, I, I read, I read the news, I, and I read the book All the Shah's Men by Stephen Kinzer, and for those of you who haven't read it, uh, do it. It's like, it costs like three bucks on Amazon. Um, and it's the story of the last democratically elected prime minister in Iran, Mohammad Mossadegh, and how he was overthrown by the CIA and the MI6. And when I, I, I think that I finished the book within a day, and I asked myself, how do we not start every conversation about Iran and the West, about Iran and Israel with that, you know, fact in mind? And then I took many more courses on Iran, and I studied Persian, and um, and I did, <laughs> and I and I still study Iran. So like I, I haven't finished. Thank you for a very intelligent talk. 
Uh, I recently watched a very short video. Um, it's about astronaut syndrome. What it is about is um, it's talking about when astronaut go to outer space and looking back at the Earth, a profound sense of uh, generosity, love, and uh, gratitude to Earth uh, really occur. That's life uh, changing feelings. Um, what that sentiment brings about is when they come back to Earth, they just start to the profound love change so much that they see the differences or conflicts on Earth or everyday things are uh, stressful just to, to a different level. So in other words, any negativity, anything that's conflict, somehow in their mind the magic will disappear. So, um, I'm Chinese, um, and uh, I know that people in China admire Jews a great deal. Um, even my friend's grandpa uh, saved a, a lot of Jews to Shanghai, and it's been um, regarded very highly. Uh, I also know that uh, Chinese people really regard uh, Iranians very highly because the uh, very traditional culture. Uh, and of course, uh, Jews are very successful in the United States. Uh, look at how many Nobel Prize winners we have, right? So, um, in the context of the uh, astronaut syndrome of the Catholic-like generic love to humanity and avoid any conflict, my question to you is, with all the brightest minds putting together Jews, Iranian, Chinese, Americans, I wonder, um, you know, what do you see the direction that we can collectively uh, put our minds together to avoid or, uh, uh, you know, uh, remove any potential conflict, but lead people toward a path of similar to astronaut uh, syndrome with hope, with um, great future that will benefit humanity. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I feel like if I give you the right answer, I can win uh, peace Nobels. <laughs> so I have to think about it very carefully. I don't want to miss this opportunity. <laughs> Maybe we should send Iran and Israel together to the space and see <laughs> how they come back. It, you know, it reminded me a cartoon that appeared in the New Yorker a few years ago of uh, aliens look on Earth from, uh, from the space and they see like rockets and missiles flying all over and they said they're flying whose religion is more peaceful. They're fighting on whose religion is more peaceful. So <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, it's, there's, I don't know. I mean, we can look at it analytically and say, you know, these are the list of conditions that have to that we have to fulfill and then it resolve every, any conflict, every conflict on earth. But it, look, Iran and Israel had great relations in the 19, uh, until 1979, but it wasn't relations between the peoples of Iran and Israel. It was between regimes. I think that today the Iranian people, for different reasons, have more appreciation of Israel, but it's to spite the Islamic Republic government. And not like because the Islamic Republic is so vehemently against Israel, like they love Israel just to, to be on the opposite side of the regime. But this is not the foundation for healthy relationship. <laughs> Um, in the past, the Iranian line was that there should be a referendum held between all the residents of Israel and Palestine regarding on what kind of um, solution they see for themselves. And Iran said that if referendum is held, Iran would respect it, any outcome. Referendum like this will never take place. Not in our lifetime. 
and we can also ask the you, we can also question the sincerity of, of such you know Iranian stance. But the thing is that uh, something that I always remind myself is that when you read scholarship and reports from 1988, nobody thought that within a year the Berlin Wall is going to be down and the USSR will be dissolved in, in a bit more than a year. So we, we never know. I mean, events have their own pace, trajectory. I don't know. We, I, I, I'm still hoping to visit Iran. So, <laughs> we have time for one final question. If anyone wants to ask, if any students have questions? As everyone, I really appreciate. Uh, presentation and answers to all the questions. But just, just on this, this issue of, of, of Israel and peace, uh, it just seems to me that the most essential and burning question for people in the Middle East uh, and, and in the world today about how to break through is recognition of the, simply the right of Israel to exist. That's the question. It's not so much this or that policy of the, this or that Israeli government, but simply the right of Israel to exist as a refuge for the Jews. We live in a world of rising anti-Semitism. It's rising here in the United States. It's rising on the University of California, Berkeley campus, which is a big problem. Uh, and so, but anyway, I, I, I wonder, that, that's a starting point, just to, to recognize Israel. On that, there's no compromise with the government in terror. They, that's precisely what they don't recognize. Uh, so, well, my question is, what, what does the professor think about that? The right of a country to exist. It is a complicated matter, right? Because like governments say many things and they change their decisions based on politics, based on what they can get out of something and what they can achieve from a di diplomatic move. And Israel and Iran, so you're right, Iran had very violent vision for like for for Israel Palestine. But even within that context, in the nineteen eighties, during the Iran Iraq war, Iran turned to Israel to supply uh, you know equipment for the Iranian military. It was a very famous scandal between Iran, Israel, the US. Um, so like the outside they spoke about you know anti-Israel and when they needed the, the the technology, the supply, they turned to Israel. And Israel, despite knowing or thinking what they think about Iran, did this you know did it, helped Iran to get the, the military equipment. With all the animosity, even today, the volume of trade between Iran and Israel is about $400 million a year. In international trade, it's not a lot of money. But between two avowed enemies, it is. It's always through a third country, and, every, and once in every few years, you will hear a story about Jaffa oranges that are found in the uh, bazaar in Tehran, and there is a major scandal, and they demand the the, the firing of whoever uh, allowed it. And but the thing is that people say things that serve them politically at the moment, but then they say other things when the moment changes and allows to other options to open up. 
I'm not, I, look, I'm not here to justify any of it. I'm just saying that I don't think that we should take, this is not something that we should take as, you know, as a ground rule for the relationship with, between Iran and Israel or future, or any future solution to this conflict. Because when, when there's economic need, when there's a political need, when there's an international moment that allows for other opportunities, they, also, they will also change the, their rhetoric towards Israel or, you know, or if something changes in Israel. But that's for another, that's for another talk. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. And thank you for coming, Professor Sturfeld. This is very, very interesting. And have a wonderful evening.